Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to invite uh, Professor Kurt Melhorn from Max Planck Institute for Informatics at Sardukan. Uh, Melhorn is a well-known figure to most Indians who work in algorithms and complexity. Uh, in fact, uh, I think uh, so many of us have gone through Max Planck that uh, he probably requires really no introduction, but nevertheless, I will. Uh, so one image that comes to mind when you think of Kurt is a man with a beatific smile. He's always smiling, and that's something that uh, I not not only me, a lot of people have actually um, we have reached this conclusion that it's really nice to sort of run into him because he will smile at you and you feel happy about it. Yeah. So before, <laughs> so <laughs> Kurt is the director emeritus of uh, MPI for Informatics and is senior professor of computer science at Starland University. He headed the uh, algorithms and complexity group at MPI for Informatics, uh, where again, as I said, a lot of people have, a lot of us, including me, have spent time. Uh, he's co-authored some 300 publications, uh, published uh, some really nice books, and is one of the people behind the LIDA software also. Uh, so Kurt has received uh, several prizes, the Leibniz Award, the EATCS Award, the Zeus Medal, uh, then uh, I'm not going to read all of it. It's there in the bio. Uh, so he holds honorary doctorate degrees from, again, several places. Uh, he's a member of the German Academy of Science, uh, at the German Academy of Science and Engineering, the US Academy of Engineering, the Indian Academy of Engineering, and the US Academy of Science. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he has, he's currently on the ERC Scientific Council, and uh, he is also on the research advisory board of the Tata Consultancy. So in fact, when we reached out to him, he of course knew completely about uh, Dr. F. C. Kohli. Uh, and uh, Kurt is also the on the advisory board of Carnegie Mellon. Uh, so today he'll talk to us about uh, fair allocation of indivisible goods. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to see several names with whom I have <laughs> collaborated. Um, so let me start right away with uh, the presentation. So I share my screen. Uh, okay, so you should be able to see my slides. So fair division of indivisible goods. This is a topic on which I have worked over the last three, four years with quite a number of, of collaborators. And maybe I start by explaining with whom I have worked. So there are two groups here. One is at the University of Frankfurt. Uh, this is, oh, I think I actually forgot a name. Giovanna, and I don't know her last name. Okay, so there's a group at the University of Frankfurt with whom we have joined forces recently. And the others are um, Hannah and Golnush are my current PhD students. Bhaskar was my PhD students and now moved to the University of Illinois. Then there is uh, Chugal Garg, who was my postdoc and Ruta Mehta, who are both at the University of Illinois. Then there is Altminis Kuritsa, who was my postdoc and is now at the University of uh, uh, Liverpool. There is Pranabendru Misra, who, is, uh, who was my postdoc and is now with you. Then uh, there is uh, Kavita, Telikapeli Kavita, who is at the Tata Institute. And then there is Quentin Vermont and Ernest van Weiland, who are at the uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. And uh, they were with me as interns. And in various collaborations, we worked together on discrete fair division. So here is the setup. Oh, uh, you can interrupt me at any time if you have questions. Yeah, we don't need to ask uh, to postpone questions to the end. So we have uh, a set of agents, N of them, and I, J, usually denotes agents. Then we have a set of indivisible goods. Indivisible means it's like a house, a car, a toothbrush. It's not salt or flour 
which you can basically split up in any way you want. Money, money, one can also basically split up in as any time we want. Then each of these agents has a valuation function. So what value he assigns to a set of goods. And instead of set, we always say bundle. Everybody calls, uh, speaks about a bundle of goods, not a set of goods, it's a bundle of goods. And uh, VI of S is the value of a bundle S to agent I. And uh, yeah, just for normalization, the empty bundle has value zero. And if a bundle is larger, then also the value should be larger. Um, there's a special, uh, an important special case, namely additive valuations, where you have values for the goods. G is always a good. And in order to determine the value of a bundle, you just add up the values of the goods in the bundle. In this talk, all valuations are additive, although we have also results for more general valuations. And the goal is you have these goods, you partition them into N bundles, one for each agent. And of course the bundle of agent I is denoted XI. And the, you want this, def, this partition to be fair. Yeah, that's the goal. You want a fair partition of the items across the agents. And uh, yeah, so the, in the first part of the talk, we discuss what we mean by fairness. So uh, here is an overview. I will first make a short digression and talk about fair division of a cake. So a cake is something which is divisible. You can cut it into pieces any way you want. Then we talk about notions of fairness envy freeness, and then relaxations of envy freeness, envy freeness up to one good, envy freeness up to any good, Nash social welfare. For each of these uh, notions of fairness, we will ask, is there an allocation satisfying this notion of fairness? And if yes, how hard is it to find one? So, we will find out that envy freeness is too much to ask for. In general, it doesn't exist, but EF1 always exists. So what is EF1? It's EF envy freeness up to one good. And this is up to any good. So what does mean any, and we will see this later in more detail, envy freeness up to one good. You have a bundle. I have a bundle. I actually like your bundle more than mine. However, there is some good in your bundle. If we remove it, I will not envy you anymore. This must be true for some good in your bundle. Or we can say this has to be, for, has to be true for any good in your bundle, and then it's EFX. The second notion is much stronger. Yeah. If it's for some good, then it's typically we remove the good which I consider most valuable. And if it's true for any good, then even after removal of the good which is the least valuable to me, the envy goes away. Then Nash social welfare is a notion which goes back to Nash. So it goes back to the 50s. Uh, and he argued that this is a, a way to capture fairness. And we come back to this. So EF1 always exists, and that's not too hard to prove. EFX is harder. And in one of our papers, we have shown that it exists for three agents. It's open whether it exists for four or more agents. Uh, it, this is a, you know, some people consider this the, the open problem in fair, discrete fair division. Then we will talk about relaxations of EFX. Uh, EFX with charity. What does EFX with charity means? Uh, we give a few of the goods to charity. And then for the remaining goods, we can allocate in an EFX manner. 
and we will show that EFX with charity exists even with a very with a small number of goods that go to charity. And then we talk about Nash social welfare. Uh, there's always an allocation which maximizes Nash social welfare, but it's hard to find the optimum one. It's even hard to approximate, but uh, constant factor approximations exist. And then we will discuss a special case where every good has just two possible values for the, for the agents. And that's a surprisingly rich structure. And my talk is based on papers with various co-authors in EC20, so the, the Conference on Electronic Commerce. There is a paper in GACM. There was one in FSTTCS two years ago. There was one in SODA last year. There will be one in AAAI this year. And there is a paper which will be in archive soon. OK, fair division of a cake. So we have one divisible good, and that's surprisingly complicated. So uh, the, the mathematical, mathematical formulation of this, of what is a cake, constitutes a cake is we have the unit interval. And for each agent, we have a density function on the unit interval. And then uh, if I give uh, this, and this, let's say to agent one, and this is his uh, valuation, then this is what he gets and this determines the value. And the goal is an, an envy-free partition. What is an envy-free partition? We want that if we look at the bundle which goes to J and the bundle which goes to I, then from the through point of agent I, the bundle XI is more valuable. So it should be true for every agent that he, uh, he likes his own bundle most. He right? does not envy any other bundle. So uh, this problem was introduced by Steinhaus in the 1940s. And for n equal to two, there is a simple solution, which you all know, uh, which you have probably used in your life. Mm -hmm. Namely, one of the two persons cuts the cake into two pieces. And of course, he will make sure that he likes the, that the two pieces are of equal value to him. He's happy with either piece. And then the other one chooses. Yeah, and then there will be no envy because the first agent cuts so that both pieces have equal value. And the second agent chooses, and of course he will choose the piece which is more valuable to him. So this is cut and choose. Cut and choose is already mentioned in the Bible uh, because when uh, Canaan and, I don't know, when they left Egypt and they entered uh, Israel, they had to decide who takes what part of Israel. And then one of them said, uh, well, there is the part left of the river, the part of the right of the river. I don't care, you choose. Yeah, so this is cut and choose. Uh, for any equal greater is the problem is complex. So it took uh, 20 years to find a solution for n equal to three in the 60s. It took another 35 years, 30 years to find a solution for arbitrary n. Now this first solution for arbitrary n, the number of cuts was not bounded by a function of n. And only five years ago, it was shown that you can do it with a number of cuts, which is bounded as a function of n by a very fast growing function of n by a function of n. So in the solution of uh, this solution, also the density functions play a role, but now it is known that you can divide. So this is a surprisingly complicated problem. Okay, now we come, uh, we go back to discrete fair division. Um, it has uh, numerous applications. I just mentioned one. Uh, whenever you have to split an inheritance or a, there's a divorce settlement, you have to split things. Who gets the house? Who gets the car? Who gets the children? No. Uh, yeah, who, who gets what? Um, this is a, a real life problem. So this is a 
an ad of a local law firm, which I saw recently. And it says, um, well, if you think your brother enjoys your bequest in the sun, you better talk to us. And we make sure that you get your fair share. Yeah. So there are also two websites. One is called Split It. The other one is called Fair Outcome, where you can uh, compute the solutions to fair division problems. For example, uh, five people together rent an apartment. The rooms have different sizes. Who should pay how much? What part of the rent? Or uh, divide chores. For example, papers to review or... Uh, your household chores, yeah. Who cleans the who cleans the dishes tonight, yeah. So uh, I mean, we, we run into these fair division problems all the time, yeah. Okay. So a quintessential notion is this notion of envy freeness, and we have seen it already, but I repair it, re repeat it. So you have two agents, I and J. And what you want is that the agent I likes the bundle that is assigned to him more or at least as much as any other bundle. Yeah, then no, no agent will envy any other agent. And um, yeah, the problem is this doesn't always exist because uh, even in the simplest case, consider two agents having in a single good and both agents would like to get this good. Well, only one can get it. The other one will envy. Yeah, so envy cannot be avoided. So then there is this uh, notion, envy freeness up to one good, which was introduced in by Budish. In, I mean, he introduced the name in this paper. The, 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 the fact that it exists was already established seven years earlier, but it wasn't given a name. So what is it, does it mean to be EF1? Well, again, we have our agent I, the bundle that he gets, the bundle XJ, which the other agent gets, the J's agent gets, and then there should be some good in X, XJ so that if you remove it, there is no envy anymore. And of course, this means the envy disappears after removing the most valuable good according to I. Yeah, it does not necessarily appear disappear if you remove the least valuable. So uh, just to understand this better, uh, let's say we have two agents, three goods, a house, a car, and a toothbrush. And they have sort of the obvious uh, valuations. They like the house much more than the car, and they like the car much more than the toothbrush. If you give uh, to one agent the house and the toothbrush, and to the other one, the car, this is EF1. Yeah, why is it EF1? Well, the guy who has the car says, yeah, yeah, I envy you, I envy you. You've got a house and a toothbrush. But if you only have the toothbrush, it's okay. Yeah, the envy goes away after removing the house. Yeah, it does not go away if you remove the toothbrush, but uh, I mean, it says, after removal of some good. Now we will see in a moment that this always exists, but of course it is, um, yeah, I mean, there is always such an allocation, but of course it's not a satisfactory notion of fairness. Yeah, uh, I mean, sort of, uh, you might say, well, I have understood that some envy is unavoidable, but I mean, it's asking too much. If I envy you, the envy should go away after removal of any good from your bundle. It should go away after removing the good which I value least. And I mean, after removing the value which I like most. Yeah, you, you got the house and then you got all these uh, things which I, I don't care about. And uh, yes, I don't care the other stuff. I don't care about the other stuff. So if you have only the other stuff, I don't envy you, but the, the house. So um, then in, uh, in a very influential paper by Karagiannis and others, in, there was introduced this notion of envy freeness up to any good. 
Yeah, so it's now not the envy should not go away after removal of some good. It should remove go away after the removal of all goods of any good. Yeah. And let's do the same example. House, car, and toothbrush. The first agent gets the house and the toothbrush. The second gets the car. And this is not EFX, right? Because if you take away the toothbrush from him, there will still be envy. Yeah, so this is not EFX. Okay. Uh, but uh, if you give the first one the house, and the second one, the car and the toothbrush, then, well, this is okay because uh, agent one will not even envy agent two. And agent two, he will envy agent one, but if you remove the house, he will not envy anymore. Now, okay, so EFX exists in this example. Now, the question again is, is there always an EFX allocation? And the answer is we don't know yet. There was an editorial by Ariel Prokacha uh, two years ago in communications of the ACM where he called it fair division's biggest problem. Does EFX exist? Now, uh, let me speed up a little bit now. I mean, it was a gentle introduction. So, Let's see for n equal to two and additive valuations, that is, does it exist? Yes. And it's a refinement of cut and choose. So here is the algorithm. So what was the cut and choose? Algorithm agent one divides, agent two chooses. So again, agent one divides, but he's, he's uh, careful now. How does he do it? He creates two empty bundles. And then he goes through the goods in, in, in decreasing order of value to him. Yeah, so the orders the goods by value. And then, then he goes through the goods in decreasing order of value to him. And uh, then there are these two bundles. There is the good G. And he puts it into the bundle of smaller value. Yeah, there are the two bundles. He looks at them and says, okay, this one has currently smaller value. Therefore, I add the good there. Yeah. And then the, the advantage of, of course, what can, now there will always be that these, these two goods will have unequal value. But the larger, the larger bundle, the bundle of more value, the, the, the amount by which it sticks out above the other bundle is at most the value of the good which was added lost, right? Because it was below, therefore you added a good and therefore it cannot exceed the value of the other by more than the value of the good that was added lost. And therefore, if you remove this good and we will go away, yeah? So the advantage of the more valuable bundle is at most the least valuable good in this bundle. Again, least valuable according to, according to agent one. And that means agent one is happy with either bundle. Yeah, he will not strongly envy the other bundle. And then uh, after agent one has determined the two bundles, agent two picks his preferred bundle. So this is a, slight generalization of cut and choose. So what is known? The state of the art of EFX. So if the agents have identical valuations, then it exists. If the valuations are additive, then for three agents, EFX exists. And for four or more agents, the question is open. If we go to a nation, a notion of EFX with, with charity, then this always exists. Now, what is charity, EFX with charity? 
Um, we partition into now not n bundles, but n plus one bundles. So we, and the n plus ones bundle, which I call P, this is the bundle which goes to charity. And uh, the requirements are that uh, the allocation restricted to the first n bundle is actually E of X. And then what goes to charity is not valuable. I mean, nobody envies the stuff that goes to charity. And also a small number of items goes to charity. So in the first paper, which we wrote, we could prove that at most N items, not more than N items have to go to charity. And we have since then improved this to N to the two thirds. And I will give you more details on this uh, later. Okay, so this is what is known about EFX. And now the next uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I will be more technical. And then I come back to uh, National Social Welfare, where we again will be easygoing. Okay, so a very important notion is the notion of an NV graph, uh, which was introduced in a paper by Richard Lipton and uh, students. So the vertices correspond to agents. So here, yeah, agents and the bundles owned by them. Yeah, and uh, we have an ed edge from I to J if I envies J. So if the bundle which is owned by J is more valuable to I than his own bundle. And then what uh, Lipton et al showed is we can always assume that this envy graph is acyclic. So assume there is a cycle like here. Then what we can do is, so if there is a cycle, we do a cyclic shift of the bundles. Yeah, so I envy you, so you give me your bundle. You envy somebody else, you ask him to give it your bundle and so on. So we do the cyclic shift. Then all the agents on the cycle improve. Yeah, they all go up. And uh, the agents outside the cycle uh, have the same stuff as before. Now, envy from the people outside the cycle to the people inside the cycle, they, they stay the same, except that they, they move along the cycle. Envy inside the cycle and envy from the cycle to the outside becomes less. Yeah, because everybody goes up. Yeah, the all the the way all ag agents improve, and this improvement cannot go on forever. Therefore, the envy graph becomes acyclic at some point. And because the valuations of all bundle all agents only improve if you do this decycling with a with a. Uh, with an allocation which is EF1 or EFX, it stays EF1 or EFX. Yeah, so this decycling procedure, which was introduced by Lipton, is, uh, is very powerful. Okay, so here is how Lipton proved that EF1 exists without having the name. So you start out with no good allocated. And then you go through the unallocated goods one by one. You say you have an allocation, which is EF1, and where the envy graph is acyclic. You take the next good, you allocate it to a source of the envy graph. This uh, will not, the allocation stays EF1. Why? Well, you have increased the value of the bundle owning owned by the source, but before you edit this good, this the, the source was not envied by anybody. So if you remove this good again, it will not be envied by anybody. Yeah? So there is no strong envy towards the source. And of course the source 
because it has now more, it will envy less. So after the this allocation, you still have an EF1, but now the envy graph might be cyclic. So you decycle again. And this uh, give you an EF1 allocation. Yeah, very simple procedure. Now, uh, does this also work for EFX? Well, it works for EFX with charity. So um, it's very simple, a very similar procedure or uh, sort of same spirit. Now we are again start with no good allocated to the agents and everything goes to charity. Then now we have uh, three rules for adding things. Again, our invariant is that the envy graph is acyclic and the allocation is EFX. We update. And the progress we make is uh, in, the, in the new allocation, no agent is worse off and at least one is better off. So we always go through towards a better allocation. Then we decycle again. And um, yeah, and if none of these, these rules is applicable, we stop. And termination, of course, follows from mon monotonicity because it's always one agent. No, no one is, uh, yeah, I mean, all at least one agent improves, at least the other one stays stable and it cannot go on forever. Now, the, the, the rules are very simple. Um, but it introduces a, a, an important notion. Um, okay, so. The first rule is suppose some agent envies the, the goods that go to charity. And the action that we do is we give a carefully chosen subset of P to a carefully chosen agent envying charity. So remember now, I guess I didn't really introduce, we need a notion of strongly envies. So an agent strongly envies a set of goods if it envies a proper subset of it, yeah. So I I envy if uh, the the set is more valuable than my own bundle, and I strongly envy if I even envy a proper subset. And then we need the notion of a minimal envied subset. So we start with P. And then we do, while some agents strongly envy Z, we do, we let, uh, we, we take a, a, a good in Z such that Z minus G is still envied by some agent and we remove G. Well, and the invariant is then that Z is still envied by some agent. And if, it's, if there is some agent that strongly envies it, then we remove another good. So that means when we end with this procedure, we have found a set which is minimal with respect to set inclusion, such that it is envied by some agent. Yeah, set is envied by some agent, but is not strongly envied by any agent. So this is our first rule. So we have an EFX allocation and some agent envies the, the bundle that goes to charity. We compute a minimal envied subset and an agent that envies this subset. And then we assign this subject to I and we change the pool in the obvious way. We take the Z out of the pool and we add XI to the pool. Now, uh, and now I is better off than before because it envied what is given to him. So he's better off than before and the others are the same. And we didn't introduce any strong envy because uh, that's how we chose the set, the, the, the set Z. The second rule is equally obvious. If there is a good in the pool, which we can add to some agent without, without uh, introducing envy, in, in out without introducing strong envy, we do so. Okay, now we need a, I mean, these two rules are very simple. Now we need a more complicated rule. 
So assume for, for a warm up that um, the envy graph has only one source. So here's our envy graph. And we have only one source. And we have an unallocated item. We give it to the source. Now, if we give it to the source, we might introduce strong envy. So we compute a minimal envy subset of the bundle of the source plus G. Yeah, so we re this was X of source plus G. We replace this by Z, which is a minimally envy subset. And then we ask ourselves, well, there is somebody, somebody envies this. Yeah, so we have an envy cycle and uh, we move along this cycle as before. Yeah, and uh, the new allocation is EFX since all agents on the cycle are better off and nobody strongly envies the the set of goods that we just introduced. And of course- is there a cycle? Can... Sorry, Pardon why me? is there a cycle? Why, why does this create a cycle? Oh, because uh, we choose a minimal NVID subset. Okay. So we choose a minimal NVID upset to make, make sure that the source is better off with the new assignment. Mm -hmm. And it's a minimal NVID subset. That means somebody envies it. Mm -hmm but not strongly, yeah? So the envy goes away, but somebody, and now we have a cycle in the envy graph because I assume that there is only one source. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So we have a cycle sure. and we decycle and we are done. Now in general, we're gonna have many sources and uh, let me just draw a picture here. So what we do is we take a first good and, um, so we take any G1 and we give it to this guy here. This will be introduced strong envy. So we compute this minimally envied subset. And then there will be some agent that envies it. This is T1. And okay, I should explain the picture. So we have several sources and these triangles are the agents that they can reach in the envy graph. And these cycles in general overlap, but for simplicity of the picture, they don't overlap here. So then we take a second good and give it to him. Again, we compute a minimally envied subset. This is a Z2 and somebody will envy it. Then we add a good to this guy Computer minimal envy subset, and at some point somebody will envy it. Now, if we if we have the number of goods that we have available is at least the number of sources, this picture will happen at some time. At some point, we create a cycle, and once we have created the cycle, we are in business again. We decycle and we have a new EFX allocation. Um, so the, the cycle doesn't necessarily have to involve. So if the, if the T3 is down here, could be, then the cycle would just involve this part of the graph. Yeah, but uh, at some point we will have a cycle. Okay, so uh, this is uh, EFX with charity. I've sort of given you a flavor of um, that this can be achieved. And we have improved this since then, the number of things that have to go to charity, we improved with a slightly weaker notion of EFXness, but let me skip this. So when we apply this algorithm to three agents, then at the end, we, have, we are left with two unallocated goods, at most two. Now, in fact, uh, the number of unallocated goods is less than the number of sources. Yeah, so if the envy graph at the end has only one source, everything is allocated. But it have, if it has uh, three sources, 
uh, then two goods might be unallocated. Now let's, the, let's try to allocate these remaining goods. And there is an obstacle which um, took us a long time to overcome. Namely, we found an, an example of a partial EFX allocation and an unallocated good such that whenever you go from this partial to a full allocation, at least one agent loses. So this uh, property that we, that we had before, that one agent goes up and the, all the others it still at least do not lose. This is not true anymore. You cannot avoid, you cannot monotonically go up for everybody. So that means we must allow, allow update rules that worsen the fate of some agent. And then it's not clear that you have termination yeah, because our termination argument relied crucially that life gets better for everyone. So then we said uh, at some point we had the idea then what we could do is we order our agents ABC and then we say we look at the lexicographic order of the triples value of the bundle for A, value of the bundle for B, value of the bundle of C and we want that this goes up lexicographically. Yeah? So we either improve the first agent or the first agent stays the same and the second one improves and so on. And uh, then we could actually find uh, uh, but, uh, an update, update rules, but I cannot go, uh, I, you have to read the paper. The, the proof is a 15 page tedious case analysis and uh, there is no way that I can even hint at what we have done. Um, I should mention here, that so this is a paper which Baskar, I, and Jugal Garg wrote together, but it's really Baskar who pushed it through. Uh, I have to be fair. I say I say I mean I discussed it very often with him over I would say months. We discussed almost every day, but my role was to point out flaws in his proof. Yeah, and uh, so I listened to him and I said no, Baskar. This is not yet it. Uh, here is a flaw. And uh, two days later, he would come back and would tell me, give me another proof. And I was like, no. Uh, so this is was Chugal's and my role. And he actually, he pushed it through. I, may, I mean, I'm very impressed. Okay, so uh, yeah, we have these update rules and um, additive valuations and more than four agents general valuations and more than th and three and more agents, additional ideas are needed. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, let me switch so we can, uh, if I lost you, can you, we start a new chapter now? Nash social welfare. So which was introduced by Nash, the famous Nash. So again, we partition into N bundles. We look at the value of the ice bundle for the ice agent, and then we form the geometric mean. And this is called the Nash social welfare of the allocation. And in the paper where Nash introduced this notion, he argued extensively that this is an appropriate notion of fairness. Yeah, in particular, if we want to, um, measure the fairness of an allocation by a single number, this is what we should look at, the geometric mean of the valuations. Uh, this has uh, important properties. For example, it's invariant under scaling. Yeah, if, uh, if I, I mean, let's say I measure my valuations in euros, and uh, then tomorrow I change to Euro cents. So that means all the numbers will be multiplied by a hundred. Yeah, if you take the sum of the valuations, then uh, suddenly it's much better to give something to me. Yeah, because it's a higher number if you count in cents. Uh, but, uh, but for national social welfare, this is not true. Yeah, if it's the geometric mean, now what would you give to me? This will be multiplied by 
a hundred if I go from euros to euro cents, and this uh, will just give us constant factor. Then this is surprising and was proved only in this paper by Karagiannis, which I mentioned a few slides before. The NS, the, the allocation which maximizes Nash social welfare is EF1. Yeah, if it, uh, so the way they proved this is they said, okay, let's uh, look at an allocation which is not EF1. Then uh, this tells us how to improve Nash social welfare. And there is also a connection to A of X, namely, if the value of any good for any agent has just two possible values, one and S, then an NS, uh, an, an allocation maximizing Nash social welfare is also E of X. Um, a little bit of intuition. Nash social welfare, or some, I mean, shifting value from the rich to the poor increases Nash social welfare. Yeah. And uh, making values more equal increases Nash social welfare. So if you have, um, let's say, values A and B, if it's possible to give both of them the average, that's better. Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah, so it, it sort of it satisfies intuitive notions of fairness. Yeah, uh, shifting value from the rich to the poor and making things more equal, which is a kind of way of shifting from the rich to the poor, makes things better. What is known? So finding an allocation which is maximizes Nash social welfare is in general is NP complete. Uh, even for two agents and identical valuations. This is just an easy reduction of subset sum. What is subset sum? You're given a list of numbers and you're asked whether you can divide it in two sets which have equal sum. Well, that, what, what does Nash social welfare do? It, it tries to split the things into two bundles whose value is as equal as possible. Yeah, so maximizing Nash social welfare in particular allows you to decide whether subset sum has a solution. Well, it's NP complete even for three valued valuations where the value of every good is either zero, one, and S. And this is a reduction from 3D matching. Uh, again, once if somebody tells you that this is uh, the right reduction, you will be able to find it. It's even hard to approximate. So it's APX hard with um, some, uh, I mean, to approximate it with a factor which is smaller than, I don't know, I think it's the, the first uh, non-zero digit is on the third place after the binary point or the decimal point. Then it's hard to approximate. What can be done efficiently? There is a 1.45 approximation algorithm by Barman, Rohit, and Vaish, your colleagues from the Indian Inst uh, from uh, yeah the Indian Institute of Science in 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 uh, Bangalore, and uh, for the very simplest case that there are only values zero and one, it's in P. And what we have asked recently is, can we delineate the border between NP completeness and being efficient more precisely? So how about uh, we have, again, two values, but not quite as simple, zero and one. The values are one and S. If there are three values, it's NP complete. If it's only zero and one, it's simple. But how about one and S? And even this case is surprisingly rich. So we have two values, one and S. If this value S is integral, there's an efficient algorithm. If uh, this value S is of the form P over Q, of course, relatively prime, and the Q is at least three, then it's NP complete. So for numbers like four over three, five over three, five over four, seven over six, uh, Nine over, no, not nine over six, nine over seven, and so on. 
it's NP complete. Now this leaves the odd multiples of one half where the question, so this is uh, our paper in triple AI. And um, yeah, the odd mid multiples of one half for three over two, it's in P. Uh, this is unpublished still, but it will be in archive in two weeks, I think. You're just uh, clean, making the last end. I don't know, I five over two, seven over two, I don't know. I believe it's in P. Uh, I believe that our methods generalize, but we haven't worked out the details. And it would be, I mean, it would be extremely surprising if it's in P for three over two and in P complete for five over two. I mean, I found it already surprising that there is a jump from, yeah. I mean, three over two, it's it's in P. If four over three, it's some some it's difficult. So let me give you, uh, I still have five minutes. Let me give you a brief indication how this is done. So, oh, I called it P here. It was S on the previous slide. So an agent is heavy, an item is heavy. If it is heavy for at least one agent, meaning it has this large value for at least one agent. And an item is light if it has value one for all agents. And an item is allocated as a heavy item. If it is given to an, to an agent which thinks it's a heavy item. And then the algorithm is, is very simple for the case where the, the S is an integer. You do the following. You first say, okay, I insist that all, let's say K is the number of heavy items. I insist that every heavy item is allocated as a heavy one. And you compute the optimal allocation, which can be done by augmenting path techniques. Um, yeah, let me, let me do it this way. Let's say here is an agent which has five heavy items. Here is an agent that has three heavy items and I can do the following. There is a good here and another good here. He owns this good, but there is an agent that likes this good, but owns this good, which he likes. When I say like is, it means he considers it heavy. Then you augment this path, meaning you take this good, you deallocate it from this agent and you allocate it to him and you take this good and you reallocate it. Then now this has four and this has four. So this way we can move an item from, an, from a large bundle to a small bundle. And one can show that this, is, this suffices. And so in this way, you can compute an optimal alloc Yeah. And, and there, is a, there is a separation. So once you have found the optimal allocation of the heavy goods, you just add the light items in a greedy manner. Yeah, you go through the light items and you always add it to a smallest bundle. Now, when you say that not every good has to be allocated, which is heavy, has to be allocated as a heavy, what you just do is you go to the bundle, to the largest bundle, is the largest number of heavy goods, you take one of them, you turn it into a light and re-optimize. And uh, if you do this, uh, one of the solutions will be the optimum. Now, if you go to S equal to three over two, the situation is much more complicated because um, yeah, you cannot consider the heavy and the light items separately. And I, I give you this example. Uh, assume we have um, two, two heavy goods and either two or three light goods. So if we have two light goods, then what we should do is we should give everybody, they have identical valuations. You should everybody give a heavy good and a light good. If you have three light goods, what you should do is you give the two heavy goods to one and the three light goods to the other. Yeah, so what this example shows is the number of light goods 
influences how you should allocate the heavy ones. Mm. And this makes the problem more complicated. And uh, what we did is we came up with a number, uh, uh, I, I skipped this with a number of update rules, which are five or six. And we can show that uh, these five or six update rules suffice to, optimate, to obtain an optimal allocation in polynomial time. Mm. Let me close and summarize. So fair division of indivisible items, it's a rich subject with many interesting open problems. So for additive valuations, more than three agents. For general valuations, more than two agents. So um, I don't really know what to believe. Does this allocation always, so my sort of what I believe in the moment, uh, today, um, <laughs> maybe I believe something else tomorrow, <laughs> is that um, for the additive valuations, the answer is yes, it always exists. For general valuations, the answer is no. Uh, I just cannot imagine that. Uh, uh, but um, I, th I thought about uh, for, a, for a day or so how, whether I could use a computer to search for a counterexample. But even for three agents and 10 goods in general valuations, the, the, the space is so rich. Yeah, the number of valuations there exist, the number of allocations there exist that um, I mean, my 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 back of the envelope compute told me uh, computation told me that there is no way. I mean, maybe if Google gives me access to all its computers, then I might be able to do the computer search. But at least not with the hardware that I have available. Then for Nash social welfare uh, approximation algorithms, the best upper bound is one point four five. The best lower bound for APX hardness is a slightly above one. So there is a huge gap. Uh, the two valued, the other multi multiples of one half, the other odd multiples of one half. And I only touched on goods. Uh, the fair division of chores is much le less developed. There is a beautiful paper by Baskar, Jugal, and Ruta recently, where they start to investigate chores. Um, why are chores harder? Uh, a good you can allocate, I mean, okay. It depends. If, I mean, goods are, you can assign a good to anybody. He might not like it, he might not value it, but you can assign it to everybody. Now for chores, it depends whether you whether somebody can say, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, you have to pay me a million that I do it, or whether somebody can say, no matter how you much, how much you pay me, I will not do it. Yeah, whether, I, whether somebody can say, whether somebody can refuse to do something, or just charge an, a large amount. Mm. If, if people can only charge a large amount, then it's similar. There, there is a, it's similar. Well, I would say it's not this, but it's, it's, it's more equal to, 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 to goods. Mm -hmm. If somebody can refuse a chore, the situation is different, very different. And, uh, this paper by Baskar, Chugal, and Ruta makes the first step. And there was before a, a step by Hervé Moulin where they considered the version where you cannot say, I refuse to do a chore, but it's just I charge outrageous amounts. Hmm. Which for all practical purposes probably is the same, but in mathematical terms, it's not the same. Yeah. Okay, I close here. Uh, if you have questions, I try to answer them. Hmm. Are there any questions? Hmm. Lovely talk. 
It was so clear. <laughs> you mean I made it too clear? It's really clear. It's really clear. <laughs> yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> you, 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 you. <laughs> but you always do this. I mean, uh, I've heard so many talks of yours. They're all like that. <laughs> but I, I tell you, I found uh, I, I'm teaching a course called Ideas and Concepts of Computer Science. So mm -hmm. I, I cover everything, you know, I do shortest path, I do searching and sorting, I do Google search, I do the internet, I do cryptography for a So this is a course for, compu for non-computer scientists. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I had to learn, sort of I, I, I told myself, okay, I do my, sli my slides with tech, at most $2 signs per slide. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, very few mathematics. Okay. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, this was okay. one thing. But now we have introduced a, a new study program for, it's called computer science and law. Mm -hmm. So one third of my students are lawyers. Well, are law mm -hmm. students. No, actually, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a program for lawyers so that they can get an additional degree or knowledge in computer science. Mm -hmm. And this is tough. This is tough. <laughs> they, they, they think completely differently. Uh, many of them are out of high school for 10 years. I mean, the last time they saw a multiplication sign was in high school. I mean, no, but the last time <laughs> they saw an integral or any, anything which is, looks like math was in high school. Mm -hmm. This is really tough. But what do and you teach them? What are you supposed to teach them? I teach them a survey of computer science. Okay. I had to learn a lot. You know, I have lectures on artificial intelligence, on neural nets. I have a lecture on quantum computing. I have a, uh, there are videos in the net, but they're all in German. Uh, but I, so first of all, sort of to bring it across in, in a language which they understand and which is not, and, and saying something which is not completely trivial. Hmm. And these guys know how to argue, you know? <laughs> you, you, I mean, yeah, yeah. there are students, they have all, have always been students that complain. Yeah, hmm. the exercises are too difficult and, uh, and so on. But these guys are trained in arguing. <laughs> and you know, they're, they're yeah. so different from our computer science students. And you can, I mean, math students and computer science students, they take everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. You can do cruel things to them and they will mm -hmm. say, okay, I have to sit down hard and, and solve my exercises. No, <laughs> these law students are different. Yeah, yeah. They, they sort of they me, feel my son is a lawyer. My son yeah, is studying okay. law, so I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And they pay for the course. Okay. That also makes a difference. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but back to questions. No, really. I think it was fantastic. Any questions? I think. I can put you under pressure now. You're supposed to prepare one. Yes. <laughs> <It's> the <mark>. <laughs> 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 Usually we have, uh, there are some suspects who always ask questions. I mean, I'm one of them, but I've already asked you my question. Uh, okay, well. <laughs> no, it was a great talk, I think. And nobody has questions? No, it looks like. Then? There is a question now. Okay, great. Who is this? Who is who's asking? Shashwat has asked. I do not understand how the multi... Oh, I sent it only to you. Only to you, Wolf. I do not understand how the multiple starting point turns into a circle in the EFX case. How the multiple... Basically, uh, when uh, the uh, when the NV uh, 
person was uh, like the NV graph started with one person. Uh, it turned into a cycle. I understood that. But when there were multiple persons, uh, I didn't understand how it turns into a cycle later. Okay. So um, maybe I, sh I can uh, go to a whiteboard. So assume you have, a, you have an agent here. And you give an additional good to him. Now, and uh, then we ask, we compute the minimal envy subset. So there will somebody, there will be somebody who envies this guy. If he's down here, then we have the cycle. cycle. Now it could be that he's in another reachability set. Yeah, so he's down here and he envies. Now we have a pass from the source here. Now we give a second. So we have uh, there are that we have, there still need to be several goods which are unallocated. We give us a good to him, and we compute a minimal envy subset. Somebody will envy this, maybe here. So we go to the source, and we add something. And the, the precondition is that we the, the number of unallocated goods is more, is at least the number of sources. Uh, that's where in the first paper came that uh, we can reduce the set that go to charity to less than N. Yes. Because at, if there are still N unallocated goods, we can proceed. Now you go on like this. And at some point, it, the, the, the guy who envies yeah, so we have here and then somebody again envies and it must be in a set which we have already seen. So maybe here. And then you have the cycle. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it cannot go on forever because the number of reachability sets is at most the number of sources and the number of sources is most the number of agents. So at some point you must have a cycle and then you're in business. Okay, got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Okay, then. No. Great. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Kurt. Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, thank you so bye -bye. much. Thank bye. You. bye. 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 Bye.